Uh, so can you see the slides? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Okay, so thank you very much for um, the very nice uh, introduction and for this invitation. And, and I'm very happy to uh, kickstart this new series of um, seminars for, for young people. So uh, today I will try to give a, a very uh, non-technical uh, overview and introduction to uh, sort of my uh, research uh, recently. Um, so it's going to be uh, highly non-technical and I will mainly focus on the context and the framework. Uh, only at the end I will mention some of my results and it will get a little bit more technical. Uh, but please uh, feel free to ask questions during the talk, uh, both uh, technical or non-technical, and I will be ha happy to, um, to answer. Uh, right. So, since uh, apparently there will not be able, will not be able to uh, have a, a coffee break uh, in person after this talk, um, I thought it was appropriate to start um, with uh, this nice picture of a cup of coffee, which sort of uh, represents where my research started, um, both geographically and, and conceptually. And indeed, I took this picture uh, in Sisa in Trieste. Um, which is famous for its coffee, and it's also where I uh, have started uh, as a PhD student um, my research. And so I wanted to start with this also because this uh, coffee allows me to uh, start with a very simple thought experiment. So imagine that uh, as I talk, you take your uh, cup of coffee that you're maybe sipping now, and that you leave it uh, outside of the, the window. So now here in Munich, it's snowing, so it doesn't take a physicist uh, to predict that if you take the cup of coffee out at the end of this talk, uh, then the coffee will be uh, cold. And so the reason why everyone knows the outcome of this uh, very simple experiment is that we're extremely used uh, to, this, uh, to these kinds of um, thermalization processes. So when processes where a microscopic object goes uh, and, and reach a, a thermal uh, state. So although this is uh, really a ubiquitous uh, phenomenon of nature, uh, it is a quite a different, a different and difficult question to try to understand this uh, from a quantitative point of view. And in particular, one question which is uh, very important is to try to understand thermalization based on uh, nowadays uh, microscopic theory, which is quantum mechanics. And so this is a, a question which is in fact um, deeply connected to uh, very fundamental um, questions. And just to mention one, uh, the famous area of time problem, um, which is essentially a problem for which um, there is seemingly an emergence uh, preferred direction in time for macroscopic object, um, whereas microscopic laws of nature uh, are invariant under time reversal. And so uh, nowadays we do have a theory that allows us to explain the properties uh, of a macroscopic object, a thermal equilibrium, uh, based on a microscopic input. And that is um, statistical mechanics, uh, more precisely quantum statistical mechanics. And so if you use this theory, then, for example, you would be able to predict the properties uh, of your coffee uh, based maybe on some uh, model uh, for the underlying interactions. Uh, however, um, standard statistical mechanics is based on uh, additional postulates uh, with respect to um, fundamental uh, quantum physics. And this was already known by the founder of um, statistical mechanics, Gibbs, there is a very nice uh, passage in the introduction of his very famous book where he says that um, due to the difficulties of, of deriving the, the postulates of statistical mechanics, um, his aim at the time was not that of, uh, you know, explain all the mysteries of nature, but rather just to start from a set of postulates and then uh, derive some consequences from there. Um, so, but now um, the, the people, of course, uh, started to think of whether one can uh, bridge this gap and uh, maybe uh, prove these postulates and um, derive these postulates. Um, and, and, and these attempts go very back in time. So the first attempt uh, in, in the quantum uh, world was done by von Neumann in 1929. 
but but this turned out to be a very difficult problem. So, for example, the validity of a micro canonical ensemble or a canonical ensemble, it's usually taken as a postulate. And to prove this based on uh, really only quantum mechanics is very, very difficult. And one of the main problems and, and, and difficulties in, in trying to complete this program um, is that uh, the, the standard um, introduction of statistical mechanics uh, is given in terms of a system, which in this case is given by our cup of coffee, which is weakly interacting with an environment. And so the trouble comes in when you try to uh, describe this uh, weak interactions, because there this is often ill, Ill, Ill control and so people have to uh, introduce some adapt assumptions and and so um, this is where um, essentially all the, the trouble is. But in, in the past 15 years it was actually realized that uh, if we want to uh, you know understand thermalization then actually there is no need to uh, deal with an environment and it makes sense to uh, study thermalization even in isolated many body systems. So this was, um, yes, roughly uh, this, this set of ideas started uh, very slowly in, in 2006 with a series of experiments and, and then uh, slowly gained momentum, uh, in particular after a very influential paper by Rigol and collaborators. Right, so let me now uh, give you the idea because at, at first it might seem surprising that we can study thermalization in isolated systems. And so let us consider now uh, a um, framework of plain quantum mechanics. So imagine that we prepare our uh, system, maybe it's a large system, but uh, we prepare it in a well defined initial state, which is denoted here by um, psi naught. And then we consider the system which evolves through a plain Schrodinger equation, which is depicted here. So one of the basic uh, you know, postulates of quantum mechanics is that if the system is initially in a pure state, then without noise, it will remain in a pure state forever. And so in particular, there is no hope that our isolated system will uh, converge towards a mixed state and so a thermal ensemble. And so from this point of view, it seems that it's not possible to try to uh, understand thermalization based on um, quantum mechanics for isolated systems. Um, however, there, uh, there is a very different uh, point of view that emerges if we look at local properties of a very extended system. So imagine now that we have uh, uh, an isolated uh, many body system with a lot of degrees of freedom. And imagine that you only focus on a tiny uh, part of this very large system. So if you initially drive the system out of equilibrium, then what you expect is that uh, essentially the system will behave as its own bath. And so the small portion of the system will be able to actually equilibrate uh, with the rest. Now, in, in practice, what does this mean and how do we make this formal? Well, um, in practice, we have, we have to consider systems that are very large. So quantum systems with a lot of degrees of freedom. So this can be, for example, quantum gases or spin chains or qubit systems. And then we consider a, a homogeneous initial state, which is driven out of equilibrium. And so the form of viewpoint is that we should consider now the time evolution of expectation values of local observables, which is written here as OA. And then we should look at the time evolution of this object only after we take the limit of an infinite system size. And so the claim is that if we do this, then it makes sense to, to study thermalization and to have um, stationary states emerging in isolated systems. So this, for example, is a plot taken from one of the early papers that uh, start to follow this approach. Um, this is a, a Bose-Haber model. So uh, it's, uh, again, a many-body system of uh, Bose um, particles. Um, and the, the system is initialized in some initial state, and here it is plotted the time evolution of some local observables. And you see that after some transient time, which may be short or long, the system seemed to reach some stationary states. Right, so um, this is very nice now because uh, this point of view allows us to really have a ab initio um, starting point from uh, trying to understand thermalization. So all in principle, all we need is quantum mechanics and a very powerful computer to try to uh, you know, probe the evolution of a system uh, up to very large times. And so the, 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 what I wanna stress is that here, we don't need any new assumption. We do not need any new postulate. So we're able to try to see whether we have thermalization or not 
only based on quantum mechanics. Now, of course, this is easier said than done. Um, and the reason is that um, the, the computational cost of this ty type of problems uh, grows exponentially with the number uh, of constituents of your system. This is usually called the curse of dimensionality. So the Hilbert space that describes your system, the dimension of your Hilbert space grows exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom. And to make things work, um, these types of problems uh, involve uh, intrinsically non-perturbative regimes. So one has to uh, invent very different methods with respect to maybe standard field theory approximations that were used for uh, equilibrium physics. And so in, in light of all these difficulties, uh, recent research, research uh, focused on um, a series of maybe simplified models, but concrete models, where one could really carry out uh, analytical or uh, numerical calculations. So with respect to other approaches, maybe in the, in the 80s, uh, where uh, ideas similar to these were um, somehow mentioned, the, the approach now was really to uh, get numbers out of these models and to try to see uh, things uh, as concretely as possible. And one of the, the motivations for, for, for this shift of, of point of view uh, came from the, the, the experimental um, side. And in particular, uh, it, this is also due to a, a, a set of, of um, progress in the physics of ultra cold atoms. So starting from early uh, 2000, um, a, a series of, of technological advances allowed us to control very well um, atoms at very low temperature and in optical traps. So what people can do now in, in cold atom laboratories is to take uh, large um, sets of atoms, so maybe thousands uh, of atoms, and to confine them in uh, uh, arbitrary geometries and uh, different effective dimensions. And also to have a very high degree on, uh, sorry, a very high control uh, on the degree of isolation uh, of your system. So which means in practice that you can realize uh, many body systems that are actually isolated with respect to the environment and to probe their time evolution to very um, high degree of control. And so in, in some experiments, people were actually able to see this kind of emergent thermalization. This is, for example, a, a, a plot taken from an experimental paper uh, in uh, 2012. Um, where um, a gas of bosons uh, was confined in one dimension and left to evolve after uh, being driven out of equilibrium. And again, so here, this is the time evolution of a local observable. It's the density at some given position. You see that there is a transient time, and after that, that there is, uh, we, we reach a stationary state. Okay, so um, this is, again, the, the, the general picture, but um, the, the thing still remains that this is a very hard problem in general to study uh, many body systems out of equilibrium. Now, in, in the past few years, there has been some progress, specifically in some special situations. One of them, which is, um, I believe, very nice, is the, the framework of the so-called integrable models, which are classes of systems where one has a extensive number of symmetries. So they're highly symmetric models where there is a lot of mathematical structure and so people were able to um, study uh, this type of uh, non-equilibrium processes uh, in, in great detail. And uh, this is also due to the pioneering work of the group of statistical physics in, in CISA, which sort of uh, led the, the research uh, in this area. But in general, for, for typical system, for typical quantum gases or spin chains, then, I mean, there's really little we can do at the analytical level, and most of the things that, most of the, the studies that have been carried out, uh, have been carried out purely numerically. Um, but there are serious limitations in terms of system size and, and time, and, and, and uh, the allowed times of simulations. Um, right, so then uh, this is where we're at, and then what we would like to do is to try to push our, our computational capabilities and try to uh, extend our analytic control of thermalization processes. Now, when I say that uh, computations are limited, I, of course, have in mind classical uh, computations on a classical computer. But uh, a very difficult, different uh, thing would be if we had a quantum computer at our disposal. Because then um, the claim is that um, we would be able to do uh, much more and to really simulate 
the dynamics. So this would be uh, actually the, the thing that we need to um, obtain the control that we want to achieve in this type of problems. Uh, okay, so now this is of course very timely because people, because different groups in the world now are, are starting to, to actually build quantum computers, although now we are still limited to um, a maximum of say 50 qubit, so we're still not there yet, but um, this type of ideas is what motivated to study um, quantum circuit models that could somehow uh, mimic uh, the time evolution in um, many body systems. So the, the, the framework that we have in mind now is that we have a set of qubits and we are allowed to update these qubits, so this quantum level system, by local unitary operations. Again, the form of viewpoint is that uh, a continuous evolution, uh, evolution of this type, you can prove that this can be approximated by discrete evolution where um, um, the individual degrees of freedom are updated locally. Um, so graphically, this means that we have something like this. So here, uh, lines at time t equal to zero would correspond to discrete a qubit arranged, for example, on a line. This is a one-dimensional picture. And so what we did, what we do at each discrete time step is to update pairs of neighboring qubits, and then we proceed in this way. Now, this is uh, essentially a type of evolution that you could imagine could be implemented in a quantum circuit. And then the, the, the point is that uh, this type of, of quantum circuit evolution, not only it's a promising experimental platform to study thermalization in isolated systems, but it's actually a very good theoretical model to study thermalization. So there has been sort of a switch of, um, of point of view where now we take this kind of uh, quantum circuit models seriously and we study thermalization in this kind of circuit models. So why would we do that? Because it turns out that these kind of models are much simpler to be studied with respect to uh, you know, more realistic continuous time evolution. And then we can uh, apply more directly tools from standard statistical mechanics or quantum information theory. Okay, so now let me go a little bit more into detail now. So again, here uh, the, the setting is uh, the following. We have a large numbers of qubits of uh, quantum uh, two-level systems, for example. And then we have a discrete uh, dynamics where we sequentially update these qubits. So the whole dynamic is uh, determined now not by an Hamiltonian, but by the choice of your, um, of your gates, of your uh, unitary uh, two-site operators. And, and this is very recent though, this, this type of, of thinking, but already in the, in the past three, four years, people started to focus on different classes of um, quantum circuit models. And in particular, two trends have emerged. So the first one is that where these unitary uh, operator, two side unitaries, are chosen randomly. And this should mimic a chaotic evolution for your many body system. But then there is a second trend of, of uh, problems that have been studied where these unitaries now are chosen in a special way, in such a way that one recovers maybe um, some conservation laws or uh, some simplifications that allow you to um, carry out numerical or uh, analytic calculations. And so in the last um, five minutes, I will discuss this last um, uh, point of view. And in particular, um, this is what we did in a uh, um, uh, recent paper in collaboration with Bruno Bertini, Ignacio Sirac, and Tomasz Prozen, where we um, essentially um, found a class of uh, unitary circuits defined by some special class of um, quantum gates for which we could actually solve uh, exactly the dynamic, prove their thermalization, and obtain a lot of uh, analytic results. Okay, so in the last, uh, say, three minutes, four minutes, I allow myself to be a little more technical. Okay, so what do we do here? Okay, so again, we um, the first step is to try to choose some unitary operators uh, that are simple enough that allows us to solve the dynamics while retaining some interesting features. So we don't want to have a trivial evolution. And so this can be done by choosing a family of unitary operations, which are called uh, dual unitary gates. Now, their definition is a bit technical, but uh, the idea is that these gates um, are defined by a property that um, 
tells you that this unitary operator not only are unitary when looked at the normal, uh, say, time direction, but they're also unitary when you look at them in the cross channel. So uh, technically, this means that, uh, I mean, this is a subset of all the possible unitary operations. So for example, in the case of qubits, uh, this family is parametrized in this way. So it's a two-site uh, unitary operator. Um, this is the most general form where u plus minus and v plus minus are single body unitary operators. And vj is a two-body uh, unitary operator which is parametrized by some um, real quantity j. Uh, and so the reason why we focused on this class is that this class with this family of unitary operators um, contain both ergodic and non-ergodic um, representatives. So in some sense, uh, it mimics the dynamics from a chaotic uh, local uh, Hamiltonian and uh, also has features that go beyond, for example, non-interacting models. OK, so. Um, then the, the idea of, um, of, of this type of problems, of quantum circuit problems, is always to try to map the quantum evolution to a two-dimensional statistical mechanics partition functions. Um, so somehow here, um, the, the, the idea is to use, again, statistical mechanics um, tools, but this is, uh, I mean, the setting is as simple as it gets. So everything is very transparent, it's very simple. And in this particular case, for this special class of uh, unitaries, we were able to actually um, find a series of exact results, which correspond to exact summations of the uh, two-dimensional partition functions. So um, in, in summary, we found we were able to prove that in these models, one always has uh, thermalization uh, to provide a, a estimate or um, to thermalization times in general. And for a certain uh, low entangled initial state, we were able to um, compute exactly uh, time dependent uh, correlation functions and the entanglement dynamics. So just to show some plots. So um, here I um, show the uh, results corresponding to two point uh, correlation functions. Um, so the, the quantity that uh, I'm plotting corresponds to this formally. Um, where we probe the correlations between two Pauli operators uh, placed at a distance r. And uh, three plots correspond to three different choices for the two-site uh, unitary operator. As I said, this family contains uh, non-ergodic uh, and also uh, ergodic uh, representatives, and these three uh, plots corresponding correspond to first non-ergodic um, evolution, then we weakly break ergodicity, and finally er ergodic evolution. So what we see is that, again, we always have thermalization because if we fix R and consider very large times, we always end up in a region where we have a stationary state, which in this case correspond to a, a thermal state, an infinite temperature state. Um, but um, there are differences if we look at what happens at the light cone of correlations. And in particular, in the non-ergodic regime, we find that information on the initial configuration is retained, whereas at uh, strong ergodicity breaking, we have that the system quickly loses memory of its initial state, even uh, at the edges of the light cone. And finally, let me stress that this kind of quantities um, that we were able to find analytically in this model are very, very difficult to compute, uh, both numerically and analytically, in typical um, many-body local uh, Hamiltonian systems. Okay, so um, finally, a, a very quick overview. Um, so I, the, the point that I want to make now uh, in, in this talk is that um, recently people started to um, study quantum circuit models very seriously as theoretical laboratories, so not just as uh, potential experimental platforms. And that this already allowed us to gain some insight in some processes of thermalization and relaxation. Also, I want to stress that now these types of models have started to gain a lot of attention in different areas of, of physics. I already mentioned quantum information and statistical mechanics, but uh, also in high energy physics. For example, uh, now this type of these types of models have been used um, to understand uh, aspects connected to the information paradox in black hole physics. And of course, there are now many open questions that remain since this is a, a very, uh, you know, very young uh, field of research. So with this, I uh, finish and I thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, for the presentation. Uh, I wonder whether there are we have a few minutes left. If uh, there is, there are some questions or comments. Um, yes, I would have some questions, if possible. Oh, please. Uh, okay. Hi, Lorenzo. I'm Pietro. Thanks ciao, ciao, Pietro. for the very nice talk. Um, I had a couple of questions which are quite general, I guess. Like uh, in some uh, slide, you've shown that uh, you can approximate any time evolution uh, with these uh, quantum circuits, right? Is it a general yes. result? Yes, and, yes. Um, ah, okay. So, okay, maybe I'll yeah, so let, me, let, me, let me elaborate. So, yes, this yeah, is a, a okay. very uh, general fact. So, if you have a continuous time evolution, uh, you can prove that this can always be approximated by this kind of discrete evolution. So at this point, one you you might answer you might ask. So if any continuous time evolution can be approximated by a quantum circuit, why is it that quantum circuits are in general easier to solve? And in fact, they're not easier to solve in general. But the point is that they allow you to find examples that are easy to solve. So it's it's a more general class, and since it's more general, there are always there are also examples in this class that are easier to solve with respect to continuous time evolution. Okay, thanks. Is it also such a general result, the fact that uh, quantum circuits can be mapped uh, onto to these statistical models uh, as we've been showing? Yes. It so is, is it uh, generally? Okay, so again, this is a good question. So uh, formally, you can always map this kind of quantum circuit evolution to a 2D statistical models. If we are in one dimension, if you were in higher dimension, this generalizes. However, the point is that usually these 2D statistical models will be very complicated. And in general, for example, the weights will, will be complex and, 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 and so will be a mess. So again, the fact that you can have this mapping does not necessarily buy you something, but uh, the, the, the realization was that since you have a lot of freedom in choosing the, the elementary constituent of this model, then uh, there is the freedom also to choose these U's in such a way that the model is simple and that, for example, the 2D statistical model becomes simple. So this is, um, uh, say, the, the answer. I hope this answers okay. your question. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Just a very short last question. Yeah. Um, like, did I understand correctly that uh, in the model that you were uh, studying, basically you could uh, uh, use some uh, analytical results so that uh, you didn't have the usual uh, constraint on the number of spins, uh, I mean 21, 22, uh, that you cannot overcome with classical simulators. Uh, I mean, did I understand correctly that uh, you managed to find uh, some analytical results that uh, in principle can allow you to go well beyond that? Yeah, so exactly. So uh, what we did was a theoretical study and uh, our our results are valid, uh, say, in, in the thermodynamic limit. So, um, we, I mean, we have results both for finite number of qubits and in the thermodynamic limit. Um, and of course, I mean, if you think about actual experimental implementation or maybe actual um, uh, quantum computers, then you will have a finite number of, uh, of uh, qubits. And so you might wonder, uh, since I, I, I stress that in order to have thermalization, you have to send the system size to infinity, how can you, uh, you know, study thermalization with a finite quantum computer? But then the point is that there is always a competition of limits. So your quantum computer is fine as as long as you probe times that in some sense are small enough compared to number of qubits. So in say in, in 200 years, we'll have a quantum computer with thousands of qubits, then this will allow you to probe experimentally times up to uh, thermalization times without uh, seeing any finite size effect. And so everything uh, will be fine. Any other okay. question? Yeah. I have a short, simple question yeah. concerning. I mean, you said uh, uh, in, in your last uh, slide for the open question uh, that uh, one should think about should think about the possible implementation. You said something now in your last response, but I mean. Uh, are there specific systems where you can find, let's say, uh, a, a potential application or just a com completely theoretical? What you well, no, no. I mean, so now uh, there are companies even that are starting to build quantum computers. Uh, so there are different um, supports, different technologies. Uh, I think that 
so of course now it's a competition of who who has the most uh, the, the largest number of qubits that can control. For example, Google, Amazon, Microsoft are all competing to build this kind of objects. I think now that the 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 biggest quantum computer on Earth has something like 50 uh, qubits. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's this is done in in superconducting um, rings, uh, and uh, but but yeah. So this is still a, 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 um, a it's a it's not very large uh, number of qubits. So now now they're starting to 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 be. Um, so this is called the um, intermediate scale quantum area because we have computers that are not as powerful as they're supposed to be. And so the hope is that in, in some future not so far away, we'll actually have a quantum computer which has you know thousands of qubits and then it's competitive against classical computers. Okay, thank you. Um, any other question? Yes, actually I have a question. Okay, please. please. Hi, Lorenzo. Hi, Sasha. Um, so did I understand correctly that you mentioned that these uh, quantum circuits are more general than continuous time evolution? Yes. And this allows you to solve or to find particularly easy cases in which you can solve, or easy cases in which you can solve the time evolution. Yes. Are these then physical or yes. do you have, a, or basically, do you have good understanding of which classes these are if they do not Correspond to something that you have in usual time, uh, continuous right, right. time. Evolution. So this is again, it, this is a good question. Um, so first of all, so we focus on one specific family, but there are others. Um, so I mean, we don't claim that we find the only solution. Uh, but uh, so there are there are different things I think that are interesting. So the first one is that um, so this is, in fact is an open question. So typicality is how much of the features that we find that are actually typical and the, how much of what we find is actually representative of actual, uh, you know, uh, continuous time evolution. So this in part is an open question, but uh, some things are understood. So for example, uh, regarding thermalization processes, I mean, the fact that you, you reach a stationary state at large times, this is typical. The fact that you usually have uh, broadenings of light cons, this is typical. Um, but, so it might be that for some classes of circuits, you will end up with something very simple that it's not good enough. For example, if you restrict to uh, so-called Clifford circuits, you get an evolution which is too simple. You have light cones that uh, you know have no broadenings, and so um, it's. I mean, you shouldn't be too 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 simple. So the model should should not be too simple. Um, and and then so the 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 the, the the, the second point is that you can always make your, your model more complicated. So then the question is, at one point your model will be so complicated it will actually be exactly the same as your continuous time evolution, but then you will not be able to solve it. Um, but, but then the final observation is that uh, maybe I didn't stress this enough. So if you have continuous time evolution, essentially the only solvable case that there is is integrable models. However, in these circuits, we also find chaotic uh, solvable points. And and and, uh, and in this case, we don't have conservation laws in, this, in the usual sense. We have features that are typical of generic Hamiltonian dynamics. For example, if you look at the uh, growth of local operators, and still they are solvable. So I think that this is um, you know what's really special about this type of models. Okay, great. Thank you. Other questions? So if not, I think it's time to thank again uh, both Lorenzi and uh, both Lorenzo for, thank you very much. for the for the seminars. And uh, I remember all of you that, I mean, uh, next month we will have another young seminar uh, um, uh, event. It's uh, on February 11. And uh, in the next case, uh, we will have uh, Barbara Bravi from uh, Col Normal Paris and uh, Andrea Plati from uh, Sapienza University. So, uh, thanks again and uh, see you again perhaps uh, next month. Bye bye. Thank All you. Right. Bye bye. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Uh, Thank tutti. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. Ciao.